You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, it's the old character shuffle in Fab Facts. The lights are on, but who's made themselves at home in the randomizer? And it's time for a more American view with David Hirsch. Oh, that's all coming up in Pod One Four Four of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Woo-hoo! Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Welcome along, one and all, including you, Richard James, to this, the Jerry Anderson podcast. Ah, thank you very much, Jamie Anderson. How are you today? I'm extremely well, but not quite as well as that mm. chap over there, Chris Dale, the randomizer oh. archbishop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that why he's got that uh, mitre on his head? Yeah, I, nice. well, I guess so. I think he's just trying oh, no. out something new. Chris, it really suits you. Yeah. I'm not so sure about the sort of frock thing, though. Oh, that's... I don't know. I think he pulls it off marvellously. Oh, all right. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Great. So, what's going on? Why are we here? And what's going to happen for the next long period yeah. of time? Yeah, you might well ask. Well, it's uh, it's the Jerry Anderson podcast, so we're here to talk all things Jerry Anderson for the next. Well, it's usually about an hour and a half, isn't it? Somehow, you, yeah, yeah. Factoring all our nonsense and <laughs> a bit of an interview and the randomizer and mm, some mm. news and uh, oh, fab facts, of course. And oh, yeah. Then there's the uh, podstrons who've been getting in touch, emailing us at the uh, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, and they've been posting on our Facebook group and hashtagging us on Twitter at hashtag Jerry Anderson yeah. Podcast. When you've taken all that into account. That's pretty much the Jerry Anderson podcast, isn't That's it? That's true. And then, but when, yeah. when you take into account you telling all, us all the stuff that we have to take into account, that then accounts yeah. for the the length of the Jerry Anderson podcast as a whole. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yes. So, wow. Well, now See, we know all yeah. that. I'm yes. very much looking forward to all those things. Are you? Are you? Are you there? <laughs> no, I really am. I really oh, am. Okay. I've I've got a huge mug of coffee here in my Tom Baker mug. Ah, oh, really? Yes. And oh, uh, really. <laughs> Yes, Sir Tom. And now, I think I might be ready. Oh, right, right. Go on. For something rather exciting, and that is this week's... Yes, what is it? Fab Facts. Oh, right then. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Fab Facts is a part of the show where I have a book of Fab Facts. I flick through the book at a random point when I'm flicking Richard Shouts Fab, which makes me stop flicking, and then I stop on that page, and then I read from that page... A fab fact. Richard, are you ready for me to flick and for you to, yourself to be shouting <sighs> fab? Well, look, you see, if you didn't say all that, the podcast would be an hour and 20, wouldn't it? And we could all get away earlier. Oh, yes, well, I'm ready. Fine. Okay, here we go. Fab! Oh, God, that uh, was very loud. Oh, I know. Sorry. Gosh, just got to change ears on my uh, Sorry on my cans there. So, oh, gosh, Richard, that's good. You've stopped us in the very late 1960s. Okay. Uh, and early 70s, in fact. Which is okay. Quite a nice place to be, isn't it? Fertile ground, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. So, Richard, we're in the so era... Richard. No, no, it's just S- Richard. So, it's not sir, yet. Richard. Yes? We are in the era of UFO. Yeah. Now, one of the most asked questions about the run of UFO is this it's question. Weeks, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's about Ed Strange's no. wig. No. <laughs> and always the purple wigs? No, it is. Yeah. Why did so many characters disappear over the course of the show's run? Right. Jay Ellis, Joan Harrington, yeah. Lou mm. Waterman, Keith Ford, and of course, Alec Freeman yes. all disappear after episode 17. Mm-hmm. But there's a simple answer. After episode 17, which was Sub Smash, the MGM mm. Borenwood Studios, where the show was being filmed, closed down. That meant that there was right. a nine-month break in production before they could resume at Pinewood. Now, mm. because most of the actors weren't under contract, and nine months is a very long time to wait, particularly in the world of acting, darling. Oh, yes. They just took other work. Yeah, as you would. Now, given the random order of the show's broadcast, where some later episodes got shown earlier and some early episodes got shown later on, it wasn't so obvious when it was first broadcast. However, two members of the UFO cast were let go for slightly more um, <clears throat> unpleasant reasons. Right. Not anything they had done, but sadly, 
behind the scenes politics. Oh no. I know. Uh oh. So one of those who was let go was Peter Gordino, who played uh, Skydiver Captain Peter Carlin. Mm -hmm. He was introduced in the first episode, in the first scene, in fact. Right. As if he was going to be one of the main characters. Uh, but then he only appeared in six episodes before disappearing. Right. Peter was told by his agent that actually that was all it was ever going to be, just those six episodes to help launch his acting career that ultimately, um, oops, never materialised. Oh, been there. However... <clears throat> The real reason he was let go was because of a contract dispute in the 1960s between Peter and Lou Grade's brother. No. Yes. Oh. So Lou wow. wasn't keen to keep him on, and thus the six episodes thing was concocted to keep uh, from hurting poor oh. Peter's feelings. Oh, no. I know. Well, it gets worse. Oh, God. Even so harsher awkward. than that yeah. was how poor George Sewell was treated. Right. Abe Mandel of ITC New York... Uh, had sold Lou Gray on the idea that uh, George's face might be harming the show's American ratings. His face? Yeah. Um, oh, right. You know, because it was sort of uh, acne scarred, pockmarked, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So when production resumed at Pinewood and Alec Freeman's name appeared in some of the new scripts, a directive was issued from somewhere about this foolish concern. Oh, oh dear. Now, depending on sources, the quote was either get rid of the guy with the pockmarked face. Ooh. Or just, even harsher, just get rid of the ugly guy. Oh, well, what? I've heard that before. Yeah, no, that's very common. <laughs> we, we've both heard that phrase, which is when we I as well. So, uh, luckily, George was so busy by then with other things that uh, he wouldn't have been able to come back anyway. And Dad and Sylvia both kept quiet about these incidents until after George and Peter had passed away. So, wow. thankfully, neither actually got to hear what had truly gone on. Yeah. Gosh. So there's two examples there of the harsher side of the world of creating TV shows and uh, how the people who hold the purse strings are often the ones who have the final say. Yes, and they're not always not. right, of course. No, yeah, of course exactly. not. I mean, Gosh. isn't that terrible? Awful, yeah. Just, you know, you never know how a, a disagreement at some point or getting on the wrong side of somebody it, it might later uh, that, yeah. get you in trouble, especially in an industry as sort of small and, and tight-knit and, and personality-driven as um, as TV and film. And of course, the awful thing is, it's very rarely about the talent on display. It's never about the acting. It's about mm. something completely trivial. He didn't get on with my brother or, you know, he looks a certain way or oh, we can't have him, he's not this, that or the other. No. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty petty, isn't it? It shouldn't be that way, no. but uh, unfortunately it is. Well, so. well. Gosh. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think George Shield was absolutely brilliant and a real kind of loss to the the series. Yeah, so it was and a, actually, a shame. now we love those character filled faces, don't we? I was oh, watching totally, um, yeah. Bloodlands, I think, a new thing on the BBC with James Nesbitt, who obviously is a little bit older than he was in, in Cold Feet, and he's got a great cragginess to him now. That obviously the lines of age and the greying yeah. hair, and uh, we but we love that. It's character. I'm not sure those decisions have been made now. No, I think you're probably right. Um, I mean, certainly the uh, the historic contract dispute would probably end up in somebody getting sued now, so that probably wouldn't yes. happen. And no, right. I agree. I agree. Character mm. faces are, yeah. you know, quite yeah. something what to I'm make. On. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> makes you more recognisable, doesn't it? It really does. Yes. yes. So anyway, it's true. <clears throat> there you go. Um, mm. that's, so these rather petty things which led to people d disappearing or not coming back or sort of did bring us to the end of this week's Face Fact yeah Face the Fact nice see what you yeah. did there very clever, it's clever, isn't very, it? clever. very nice well that's very good now this is actually my favourite part of the Jerry Anderson podcast it's where I pop over to our Facebook group facebookgroup.com uh, forward slash groups forward slash posterons let everyone know that we're about to record a podcast and ask them to tell me what they would like to ask or tell Jamie. Oh, no. Ready for these, Jamie? Sometimes. Yeah. Good. Matthew <laughs> Alderman Harris, a question for both of you, actually. Oh, What's your favourite Anderson episode ever? Oh. I know it's ever. a really easy one to go to, but Trapped in the Sky is always such a good one. It's such, yeah. a, such a great episode, so much cool stuff going on. But can I go a bit wild and say Time to Kill, Space Precinct? Really? Yeah. Great. Because, because, because I was around for it being filmed. I know you were yeah. as well, Richard. I seem to <laughs> yeah, have heard a mention of that. Yeah, um, yeah. There's something extra special about it because there's not many shows 
where I, yeah. I remember it being made and seeing cool bits of it and then seeing it all come together. So I think for me, it made that kind of impression. Yeah. What about you, Richard James? Oh, I bet yours is a space anyway. breaching tap, isn't it? No, it's not, actually. Ooh, I'd, really? No, I'd have to go for Breakaway. I'd have to go for Space ah. 1999 Breakaway, which I think is a, a fantastic story. I remember watching it uh, back in 70-whatever it was <clears throat> uh, <laughs> on its first run and uh, being absolutely blown away. Here, for me, was, uh, was Star Wars on TV, essentially. Here, for me, was... 2001 uh, Space Odyssey on TV. Okay. Uh, nice. Extraordinary. The design, the concept. Yeah, I remember being completely uh, in awe of it. So, yes, breakaway. Mm. How about you, Matthew? Let us know what's your favourite yes. ever. Uh, Zach Reynolds says, Is there any truth to the rumour that the original name for the uh, antagonists in Captain Scarlet was supposed to be the Mysterians, but it got changed to Mysterons because the name was already used in the 1957 film The Mysterians by Toho Pictures? I do not know, but I know a man who does. Uh, Chris Dale, what do you think about that? Let us know. Post on the on the group. I, yeah. I've certainly heard something like that said before. And even now, actually, people who haven't watched Scarlet for a long time will often misremember the Mysterons as the Mysterions. Mysterions. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Tom Hodden says, could we get a primer on the not quite Jerry Anderson manga series like uh, Thunderbirds 2084 or the previous incarnation of Firestorm? I know Jerry Anderson fans were disappointed, but the production deals and their existence seems to be an interesting story. Maybe. I don't think we know enough about them. I mean, again, uh, randomizer General Chris, mm-hmm. you know, what, do you know enough about 2086 or about the uh, the original Firestorm series? I mean, we could probably come up with some interesting stuff there, but um, yeah. it might not be yeah. terribly favourable. That's the only problem. Yeah. Uh, Penny Jones says, I'm sure someone's asked this before, but a lot of uh, his dad's shows didn't have a final episode to end the story mm. due to the uncertain broadcast order. If Jamie was allowed to add a single episode to the end of one series to wrap it up neatly... Which would he choose and why? Oh, well, hmm. I mean... I, uh, I, he it, did it with Terror Horse, of course. Yeah, well, uh, even oh. then we left it slightly open-ended. You did. And there's, there, is a, yes. there is a bit more story to tell there. I think Space 1999 feels like one where you don't want the poor Alvins drifting on forever. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, once they're out in space, there are further adventures to go on. So it wouldn't, you know, it would be a nice close, but it wouldn't yeah. end things. Yes. So that is probably quite a good one because if you did it with Scarlet, you know what we win over the Mistrons, it mm. feels a bit too too binary there. I don't know. Maybe yeah. Space Nineteen Ninety Nine. What about you, Richard James? Yeah, Space no, Precinct? <laughs> no, no. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, there's an idea, eh? Yeah, there's an idea. But again, it's a never-ending story in a sense. How could you finish that? You know, yes. there's sort of episodic adventures. There's they no are. more crime on Altor, <laughs> and right. everybody retired. <laughs> That's right. That would be nice, yeah. Melvin says, I should like to know more about the farm, Jamie. For a brief time, oh. I seem to recall regular farm updates in the podcast and always loved them. To that end, spring grass is coming in soon. So are any of his horses or ponies good doers? <laughs> And if so, do they wear grazing muzzles to limit their grass intake? No, no, no. I mean, um, right. the, the you're going to have to explain here. The farm is in the middle of um, of, of coal country, so uh, one side of the farm, the, the fields are actually coal tip, so the, the grass isn't too lush there. But a, a good deal is when they basically get fat on grass. Oh, okay. Um, and we don't we don't have any that get really fat on on grass, so no grazing muzzles required because they can get uh, this terrible thing, uh, laminitis, Richard, uh-huh. which is where they <laughs> yeah. sort of the hoof wall collapses basically and the, the bone descends through it and it's just horrendous. Yeah. Um, so that's why you want to be careful of that. Uh, no other farm news. Uh, we've got four or five ewes in lamb. So right, lovely. Little, little lambs due in uh, in the first week of April. Yeah. And um, got some new chickens. Oh. Uh, we've got a poorly guinea pig who's currently in the kitchen. Oh uh, but recovering, I hasten to add, not you know, yeah. not lined up as an ingredient not in a, for him. Not in, no, right. <coughs> so yes, yeah, all fine. Yeah, we're good. And finally, uh, now, Jamie, have you got your wedding hat? <laughs> I've got my Lieutenant Green hat. <laughs> okay, well, because Luna posted on our Facebook group, she wanted everyone to know that Jerry and Sylvia's work has brought her and Mark Gardner together. I'm sure we're not the first couple, says Luna, to have met or got together through Anderson, but it's special to us nonetheless. Aww. And uh, Dave Lawson commented, I think others should reveal if they have been brought together as Anderson fans. So uh, that's lovely news, isn't it? In the middle of all the, you know, the, the grim news at the moment. Uh, a lovely thing to hear. So, yes, let's open that out. Listeners at home, do you, are you part or have you ever been part of a relationship that uh, formed around your love of Anderson? Did you meet someone at a convention or online? 
tell us. Let us know. Because we're nosy. Uh, send your uh, emails into podcast at jerryanson.co.uk and we'll read them out next time. Well, obviously, Richard, uh, you know, you you and I are yes. uh, an example well, of... Uh... So, yeah, uh, well, <laughs> OK. I mean, it, it's certainly a relationship. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's the, it's a, yeah. A, 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 an Anderson Universe bromance, as we just discovered. OK. Anyway. That's I, I, I was it. thinking more of me and Charlotte, but OK. Oh, can, oh sorry. Yeah. I forgot I forgot yes. about your wife for a moment there. You forgot I, I met my wife on Space Breeze. Yeah, yeah, these fine. things happen. Uh, OK. Yeah. Uh, moving there swiftly on before I, think I we should. cause any divorces, um, mm. <laughs> let's go over to this week's Jerry Anderson News. Here is the uh, Jerry Anderson News, also known by Richard as the... Uh, Newsy News News News. Yes, yeah, so let's uh, kick off this week with... It's the Jerry Anderson News, so let's start with the glorious Thunderbirds kits from Bachman. Uh, wow. Well, lots of you already know about them, obviously, because you've been buying them in your droves. There's your favourite word, Richard. Droves. Yes. Droves. Uh, Thunderbird 2, Thunderbird 1, Thunderbird 3... Uh, Thunderbird 4, Thunderbird 5 with Thunderbird 3. Yes, there's a Thunderbird 5 kit for you Thunderbird 5 fans out there. The Fire Flash, a transparent uh, Thunderbird 2, which is really lovely. Thunderbird 2 and Thunderbird 1's launch bays and a Fire Flash. Oh, and a Fab 1 too. I probably missed something, but they are absolutely glorious. They are arriving in stock this week and will be going out immediately. So do go and grab those. They look lovely. And if you've bought them... Mm -hmm. then please do send in your fully made-up kits or even pictures of the progress. We'd love to see to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. That would be great. Uh, Thunderbird 6 fans, not a kit, I'm afraid, but there is now a Thunderbird 6 logo T-shirt in the store. So if you want to pick up one of those and show your love for the famous Tiger Moth, then, well, you should do that. Yeah. It's now less than a month to Jerry Anderson Day, the first ever international Jerry Anderson Day. Lots and lots of cool stuff coming up, and we're going to be making some announcements in the next couple of weeks. Some great partners, some lovely uh, content. I know that's a bit of a naff word, isn't it? Mm. Content, but you know what I mean. Some lovely content. And Richard, I think I've already roped you into this. Mm -hmm. There will be a Jerry Anderson Day Fab Live. More information to follow. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to this. If you want to celebrate in advance, you can grab yourself a Jerry Anderson Day t-shirt or mug. Just search Jerry Anderson Day on the store, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. And uh, we'd love to see as many of you as possible in your GA Day t-shirts for Jerry Anderson Day on the 14th of April. So if you grab one ahead of time, send in a picture, a selfie, a GA Day t-shirt or mug selfie to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll start collating those. Can't wait. Have you seen Chris Dale's amazing Metamorphosis of Space 1999 video on our YouTube channel. What? You haven't seen it yet? What's wrong with you? You're missing out. It's fantastic. I know I said last week is really, really smashing and people are loving it. Uh, lots of comments, including uh, one from Karen here who says, I've never heard of a show called The Metamorphosis of Space 1999 and it looks rubbish. Well, uh, <laughs> I think Karen may have missed the point there, but uh, it's a glorious, glorious video. Well done, Chris. Speaking of well done for Chris, did you know that the randomizer general himself, Chris Dale, also runs our Instagram account? Yes, he Great. does. That's why there's so much beautiful imagery on there. What? You don't follow the Jerry Anderson TV Instagram account? What are you doing? Go to Instagram.com slash Jerry Anderson TV or just search Jerry Anderson TV on your Instagram app and give us a follow because clever old Chris has brought us up to 20,000 followers on Instagram, which is amazing because, you know, we're not Disney or Marvel, not yet. So that sort of number is amazing. And in fact, we've just hit 40,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel too. Uh, so well done to the whole team who've been making brilliant content for that. Finally, something a little bit frustrating. It's just the way of the world currently with uh, COVID and all that sort of stuff going on. Lots of delays on 1612 pre-orders. I know I have emailed most of you um, with the help of Tim and Louise. So if you're if you want to find an update on pre-order delivery dates and estimates, which are probably likely to change still, I have to be realistic about this because these things are being made in China and then coming over and there's shipping delays and all sorts of stuff going on. Just check your inbox. You should have an email already. If not, just email support at Jerry Andy and Louise or Tim or somebody will get back to you uh, ASAP with an update. But uh, it's all in hand. No need to worry. Just a bit of a frustrating delay. I think that's quite a lot of good stuff and only a tiny bit of less good stuff. But that's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm in that episode of the Jerry Anderson News. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's, it's, all, it's all good, isn't it? 
<laughs> I mean, Mr. everything's no. good. There's, as you always say, there's new Jerry Anderson stuff in our yes. right now. Oh, yeah. it's Except true. For. And it's never been truer. I haven't said it for a while, but it's never been truer. That's the thing. Uh, no, you, you, uh, I think you're right. Right now, of all... Yeah, it's, it's just extraordinary. Anyway, um, talking of uh, true things... Uh-oh. There's never been a truer fact than people can get in touch with us via email. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes, you're, you're quite right. <laughs> Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, for example, Steve says, Hi, chaps. I had an interesting episode discussion last night at the Potter's Arms. So this is on our Facebook group. We discussed the first episode of Space Precinct. I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> uh, the episode was double duty. There was yes. a lot of agreement in that the music was fantastic. We also agreed that the dubbing was particularly awful and in part unnecessary. Uh, there was obviously no expert from the police as the procedural aspects were sadly lacking. No oh. gloves, walking all over the crime scene, and they were in and out too quick. Well, story of my life. Uh, also, the actor who played Officer Hubble Orin was outstanding. Any ideas who this could be? He says, obviously you won't read this part as you don't like to mention your involvement in this show. <laughs> no. All the best, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, nice. All fair comments, I think. Chris Yost said, I just finished watching A Little Art for Supercar's 60th anniversary and got to wondering if a full-sized print of the painting Mexican Plane could be made for sale. Thanks wow. again for all you guys do. do you, are you familiar with that, Jamie? Uh, I'm not off the top of my head, but um, yeah. grabbing these bits from film is really hard because the definition is just never, never enough. Sure, yes. Um, I mean, even a full-frame shot in high definition... Of a, yeah. of a painting like that, you, you couldn't reproduce it that way. Mm. So we yeah, require some enough. degree of repainting, and, blah, blah, blah. Yes. and that's pretty niche. But you never know. Never, never say know. Never. Dr. Rick got in touch. Hello, can I suggest the author, Hi, Dr. Ryan, Rick. <laughs> yeah, Ryan Hughes? He's the Matthew Sweet of science fiction uh, for an interview. I can't vouch for the Jerry Anderson connection, but there are two references to Jerry Anderson in the first ten pages of his novel XX, which is, in my opinion, a wonderful novel. But I'm sure he'd make for a fascinating guest. All the best, and thank you for the weekly refuge. Oh, I had a quick... Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Weekly refuse. Sorry. Refuse. No, no, no. It is It is refuge. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, I um, don't know uh, I had a quick Hughes. search for him, but I couldn't find yeah. an easy way to contact him, so okay. uh, Dr. Rick, if you could yeah. um, let us yeah. know Do how we how we can reach him, then please let us know. That's right. And finally, Emma Nichols got in touch. Hi, Jamie, Richard, Chris and Podstrons. I've been playing a game in the podcast group on Facebook called Would You Rather? I heard it on my local radio station, so I thought to myself, why not try it in the group? It's gone down so well. And here's one for you, Jamie, uh, brother, you, Jamie, Richard and Chris. What would you rather hang out with Joe 90 or go on police patrol with Officer Orin? Uh, Orin, I mean, obs. I mean, there you go. No contest, is it? I do that every week anyway, don't I, Dickie? You do? Are you lucky? <laughs> yes. Very good. Thanks for that, Emma. So, yes, do get in touch. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and I'll read out your emails next time. Lovely. I mm. can't wait. No. But while we do wait... Oh, yeah. I mean, should we have an interview? Oh, have you got one? Well, I do, but I didn't uh, undertake this interview, nor did no. you, nor did Chris Dale. That's it's rather right. exciting. This yeah. week, we've got an all-American feature. It's David mm -hmm. Hirsch being interviewed by Ben Page. Uh, that's mm -hmm. podcast producer Ben. And uh, David, who, well, has multiple fingers in, in multiple Anderson pies, but you may know him from Starlog fame or from the, the lovely Super Space Theatre uh, movie uh -huh. cuts of the uh, various Space 1999 and other, other shows. But yes, it's all American, and it means we get a break. So that's rather oh, nice, isn't it? So uh, we'll, we'll just sit back and hand over to Ben and David Hirsch. Yes. So it's David Hirsch. He is a familiar face to many in the Anderfan community. Well, Ben has said here, I maybe don't know where ben, ben has said it or David says, but uh, after growing up as one of America's number one Anderson fans, and that sounds about right, uh, David yeah. made the journey across the pond and worked with Jerry Anderson himself on an aborted project called Five Star Five. That sounds a bit familiar there, Richard, doesn't it? But let's touch on that oh, another time. As a yeah. correspondent for Starlog magazine, David edited a regular column with Dad, Jerry Anderson's Space Report. Uh, he also worked on several of the ITC compilation films and... On the Terror Hawks audio series for Big Finish, they did two scripts for us there. Uh, great. And they were great. So, without yeah. further ado, here is David Hirsch. Okay. I'm Ben Page with the Jerry Anderson Podcast, and I'm here with David Hirsch. Hello, David. Hi. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Yeah. All right. How was your Christmas? It's been uh, busy. Uh, I work in retail, so we've actually been pretty busy. Uh, you know, end of the yeah. year and be doing... <laughs> 
uh, retail optical. Uh, a lot of people have to use their uh, benefits before the end of the year. So yeah. for us, it's a busy time, which is good. Hopefully uh, finding a way to keep safe. Yeah. Despite all the craziness. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, procedures at the store. You know, people, if they try on a frame, you have to clean it afterwards. So yeah. we do a lot of that. So you're you're a name that a lot of uh, Ander fans would have heard before. I'm sure Jamie gave you an introduction before this feature came on. But yeah. tell us a little bit about who you are and why Anderson fans might know you. Well, I started out of college. I went to work for Starlog Magazine, which was a science fiction magazine out of New York. Uh, initially, I was a summer intern, and I got the gig there because I was friends with uh, Bob Mandel at ITC. I had written a uh, paper on Jerry and Sylvia Anderson for one of my college classes, and I went to ITC to do research work because at the time, you had to go to a source. There was no internet. Right. And he, in turn, gave my name to Starlog when they were doing Eagle Blueprints because the artist Jeff Mandel needed somebody who was more familiar with the ship to give him pointers on that. And through that, the magazine brought me on as a summer intern, and we did the Space 1999 Alpha Tech Notebook for them. Okay. And with the money I made off of that, I got my first trip to England, got in touch with Jerry, and uh, met him at his uh, studio office. And uh, a friendship formed, and we worked on and off for several years on various projects. He was a uh, contributor to Starlog in various degrees, including a column. Uh -huh. And um, I would work as a consultant on several projects that he was developing with the hope that I would be working with him uh, in England. Uh, but unfortunately, when it came time to do Terra Hawks, because of the show's budget, he couldn't justify bringing an American onto the production. So unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen. And at that time, I left the magazine, went into business with my father, and continued to do freelance writing. Gotcha. That's a great uh, opening summary. If I could wind the clock back a little bit. Sure. Uh, when did you first discover Jerry Anderson? What's your earliest memory? Oh, um, I, was, I think Fireball XL5 was the first show. You know, with syndication here, I think Supercar ran almost simultaneously on okay. and off. But Fireball was networked uh, yeah. on Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings. So uh, I watched that. I remember Supercar was on Channel 11 here in New York. Usually I had to run home from school to watch it just after school because they usually ran it like 4, 4.30 or something like that. On a weekday. Right. So anytime a show would come up in TV Guide in the fall that somehow said this could be another one of their series – I immediately watched it, and we got all the shows right through to uh, Captain Scarlet, and uh, always saw their names in the end credits. So anytime they did a show, you know, I, I loved it, and um, I was kind of like the expert on the shows when I worked at Starlog because I'm yeah. familiar with them all. What was it about the shows that hooked you? Do you think as a kid? I think it was the you know not only the stories but the craftsmanship. I mean, um, as a kid, when you're into building models and stuff, you look at these shows and go, I could probably do that if I learn how to build that model or, uh, you know, I'm sure there were some people who wanted to try and carve their own puppets. Sure. Yeah. It just, it, there was such a connection you could have to something that was so physical versus an animated show that you could see yourself doing it. And um, it, it just, spoke, just spoke to me, uh, the whole, the world that he cre they, they created, where characters, you know, were always doing things. You know, it was always very good and evil, simple stories that, you know, as a child spoke to you. Uh, now, we're both Americans. And Americans <laughs> have a bit of a, a different perspective on puppetry sometimes. Did it jump out to you that it was a puppet show? Was that a, a you just oh, said it was the physical aspect of it? Well, definitely it was unusual because the only other puppets you had on television at the time were ventriloquist dummies like Jerry Mahoney. Yeah. Uh, so the fact that these kind of walked and talked on their own, even though, you, you know, you did see the wires, 
it, it just was more amazing because there was such uh, craftsmanship in the sets. The visual effects were like nothing you saw on even regular television. You, you never saw something that extreme. I mean, I remember uh, once I was, my mother took me to the doctor because I was, I was ill with the flu. And my doctor was right across the street from a movie theater that we frequented. And I see the on the marquee, Thunderbirds are go. Oh. And I'm like, uh, I want to see that. She goes, no, you're sick. You're going home. Oh. And I'm home in bed watching TV and the commercial comes on for the movie. Oh, and wow. Come hell or high water, I'm going to this movie, even if I have to sit in the theater by myself, which I did, <laughs> to watch this movie because this was the greatest thing. The fact that I was going to see them in a theater uh, on the big screen. And, you know, we didn't have the kind of merchandising or the, uh, you know, other shows talking about it. I mean, you have, you have the videos now of like Des Connor doing, um, you know, his little stingray in the bathtub thing. Right. There was none of that here. The shows were just on and they moved out. Um, Fireball was one of the few shows that had heavy merchandising, but we had, you know, bits and pieces. Supercar had some great stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there was very little on Stingray, I remember. Mm -hmm. And Thunderbirds, there was some stuff when we had to, there was a lot of imported Japanese kits at the time, which you could pick up. Were you uh, a model builder, David? I tried to be. Yeah. Uh, you know. Hobbyist. Um, my mom was the one of those, those mothers who said, you can't make a mess in the house. <laughs> so if I put the model together, painting was never something I was much allowed to do. <laughs> So any of the kits like the, the Lincoln Thunderbirds that you could just snap together and slap the decals on because they were pre-colored were like, ah, those are good. Those will work. Yeah, yeah. But I had all the dinkies. Uh, you know, she used to order them through the FAO Schwartz catalog. Oh, wow. So those were great. I mean, I mean, they seemed expensive at the time. If you look at the prices now, you're going, wow, that was really cheap. But, <laughs> you know, it, it equivalent, it's equivalent in the dollars now that you're paying for like the 1612 die gas. Uh -huh. so. Now in the UK, they were mostly, uh, most of the shows were seen in black and white, even though they were filmed yeah. in color. Were you yeah. seeing them in black and white or did you have a color set? I got a color set when I was about 13. So I think I got to see Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet in color. I don't think I ever gotcha. saw Stingray. I don't think I saw Stingray in color till later because I was, it was a surprise to me when you saw the op the original opening credits, which start off in black and white, and then when yes. the ocean explodes, it goes color. And here's the funny bit about that. Martin Bauer, who was a big Jerry Anderson fan, never saw Stingray until later years in color, and he was surprised because I had told him about that opening. He goes, nah, 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 it's all in color, because he had only seen some second season episodes in uh -huh. color, which yeah. start off in color. with the color opening. And he was, he was surprised. I was going, well, you see, we all had that. We all shared that. But I used to, I mean, I remember uh, I had black and white for years. You used to have to watch Star Trek at a friend's house in color because we only had black and white in our house. Yeah. And you said so. that that started to translate into uh, some of your own creative work. Were you a writer of fan fiction or? I think I did some fan fiction, you know, just for myself. There was really nobody else to read it. Uh -huh. uh, um I mean, my big writing was the the piece that I wrote for uh, college, uh, which was on on the history of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. Uh, now, was so this a thesis? It was kind of an end of the year paper we had to write. Gotcha. So a lot of stuff had to be drawn from memory because it was so hard to find things. I remember I used to sit in the, the school library and go through um, microfiche to find reviews of like Journey to the Far Side of the Sun just uh -huh. to remember some of the people because <clears throat> it had been on television twice on NBC. Um, and that's all I remembered. So I was lucky that ITC was able to load me up with uh, episode guides because all the syndicated shows, of course, had episode uh, guides to give to the stations that ran it. And Bob Mandel just loaned me up with tons of stuff. I mean, um, as the story went, 
when I went to the <laughs> office, I, I didn't know where they were exactly. I mean, I had no idea the geography of Manhattan. I just had this, the office address. Uh-huh. And I walked from the train station uptown in a torrential downpour without an umbrella. <laughs> so that worked to my advantage because I show up uh, in the, uh, at the uh, receptionist looking like a drowned rat. And she was like uh, taking pity on me uh-huh. and said, I've got somebody who could talk to you. And the next thing I find out, it's, it's the son of the owner of the company who's wow. doing a uh, promotion. And uh, as I said, we got along really well. Bob, you know, he uh, always kept uh, me in the loop. Uh, later on and then uh, uh, you know hooked me up with Starlog and then about <clears throat> two years after I worked for Starlog we started doing the super space theater movies yeah uh, um, which was primarily uh, born of the fact that uh, ITC London had done Destination Moonbase Alpha which was the bringers of wonder two-parter for theatrical because ITC had done uh, theatrical two-parters from their shows for years because there were some territories that they couldn't get on television or didn't have television, but they had movie theaters. So they did that. They were planning to do um, alien attack, which was uh, uh, breakaway and war games. Mm-hmm. So Bob and I were having a discussion one day. Uh, Cause I used to go up there quite a lot. And uh, I did some conventions where he would loan me 16 mil prints to show at the conventions. And we came up with the idea of let's do a syndication package for cable television which was in its infancy and they were dying for product and it was a it was an excuse for me to also watch the shows for the first time i had never seen joe 90 up to that point i was going to ask about joe 90 because it wouldn't have been yeah. broadcast very widely in america no it ne- it was never broadcast in america never gotcha. um, same with the secret service yes uh well the tv movies that we did was the first time it got broadcast here uh, and it wasn't until the uh, DVDs came out through A&E that anyone saw all of Joe 90. And the funny thing with Secret Service was we got Secret Service first before it was released on DVD in England. That's true. Yeah. So um, that was that was interesting. But, um, you know, it, so it was a two, it was a two edged deal for me to do the TV movies. It got me uh, the opportunity to see a lot of shows. Mm hmm that I hadn't seen, especially shows that I wanted to see again. I mean, um, I was hoping we could do secret service, supercar fireball, but they didn't want to do the black and white shows and they didn't want to do secret Uh service. I I mean, I was lucky to get Joe 90 in the package at all. Um, because we had problems with the fact that, um, we had a nine year old character with a gun. (laughs) What did you make of Joe 90 seeing it later on in life, not having the benefit of seeing it as a nine year old? I, I think I've appreciated the show more, especially now. I mean, uh, you know, I, I watched them when they came out on DVD and then when network put out the Blu-rays, which are fabulous, you see that story wise, it's probably the best written of all the Anderson shows in, in the sense of it's almost completely character driven. Mm-hmm. It's very ambitious what they try to do with the characters. Right. And that's what makes that show special. I mean, the one thing that's unique about all the Anderson shows, every show is a quantum leap from the previous show. Mm. You have Four Feather Falls, which started off as a very ambitious Western, which, which really sold people riding on horses, which was amazing. They, you know, I, I know Jerry always had a problem with puppets walking, but they still managed to make a four-legged dog walk, which, <laughs> which was amazing. Then you go to Supercar, which became a one-hour show, a half-hour show, which was unusual at the time, since most puppet shows were 15 minutes. Yeah, It was more ambitious. It was, again, very character-driven, thanks to uh, the two brothers who wrote the first series. Mm-hmm. Really you set and Martin the Woodhouse? Right. Did, did some wonderful characters, some great dialogue. Yeah. I agree. Fireball was uh, ambitious in the sense that it was very film noir, great camera work, uh, more elaborate effects. Stingray goes color. All the puppets have expressive heads now. So there's acting in the puppets by the fact that suddenly they're smiling, frowning, which is something they, they went to, to great lengths, but kind of toned down in later shows, probably because of the time factor and switching heads. Yeah. Thunderbirds, you had a one-hour format. 
which told a much more uh, ambitious story. Mm -hmm. Captain Scarlet went into real proportion puppets, very realistic sets. You look at any Captain Scarlet set without a puppet and it looks like a life-size set. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very dark story. John Andy again in the character. And then Secret Service tried to do something more comical, more, you know, almost Monty Python is, uh, but, yeah. uh, but this, that weird live action puppet combination, which, you know, once you get over the initial shock of it, <laughs> it's kind of, you kind of embrace the weirdness of it. Yeah. You know, uh, I think it was, was it more haste, less speed, which uh-huh. is one of the few ones they did on Blu-ray uh-huh. It's just wonderfully left of center. It, it's yeah. just like, what drugs were they on when they wrote this or shot this? <laughs> I mean, it's like nobody normally could sit there and go, oh, this is going to be a good episode of television. No, they're just saying we're going to have fun. I wonder if the the quirky Britishness of it is more humorous to us as Americans than it would be to a British person. You know, it's, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> uh, being the fact that we know, of course, that Monty Python was very successful in England uh-huh. and it it tra- eventually translated well here, but not for everybody. So I think yeah. it's it's. I think Lou Gray was right in understanding the show was going to be extremely niche, and it wasn't going to be the kind of show that he could sell as easily as the other shows. I mean, that's the one thing I've learned about about Lou Gray and why most Jerry shows were only one season or season and a half, is the fact that Lou found it easier to sell a brand new show versus another season. Yeah. So I think that's why Thunderbirds probably got canceled after six episodes on the second series, because he realized no matter how successful it is, he's not going to get the sales on those six episodes that he is on a brand new series. Makes sense. I think think that's why a lot of Jerry shows were like that, but they've all been what, what the industry calls an evergreen show. They play constantly. And even the later shows, which, uh, you know, in hindsight, you know, I look back and said, you know, these are going to disappear because they're not as good. I mean, mm-hmm. when Terror Hawks came out, my initial reaction was, this is a giant leap back to supercar. Right. Much lower budget. Well, it wasn't what I expected because I had been involved in some of the pre-production on the show. Was it Thunderhawks at that point? Oh, there was all different concepts to it. But yeah. I, I remember being at Jerry's house for dinner one night with him and Mary, and he brought out the big sales brochure, which had the Martin Bauer uh, Thunderhawk on the cover. And we, I read it over and I was like suggesting changes. Like I think he had um, a hawk nest on an island off the coast of South America. And I said, well, this is Thunderbirds again. Why don't you put it in the middle of the jungle in South America? Mm-hmm. It makes it easier for them to get, because they were talking about supp- the supply. I think, I think the overlander was in the, perspective i said well this makes more sense that it could get to the base this way Uh, you know uh, there was a lot of changes to the show and then when it came out it was sort of like this is not i expected a more adult show Mm. based on the perspective not what it was but really uh, it wasn't until we did the uh they did the audio series that i really began to appreciate the show and uh, now i can look back and rewatch the shows and i enjoy them a lot more because I kind of see, again, there's a little bit of a left of center attitude. Yeah. But more so, so in the audio books. I mean, the audio books, come on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, when, when Stephen and Andrew did their clone story in the first series, uh, that blew me away. Yeah. Uh, that was where the whole audio series really sold itself for me. I really want to dig into those, but I'd, I'd oh, also yeah. like to hear about uh, how you got connected with writing for Starlog, because, of course, you knew Rob Mandel or Bob Mandel. I, well, being a summer intern, you know, I was there doing mostly things like doing the mail order department, you know, gotcha. shipping out stuff. And they'd have me proofread articles and stuff. And we got along really well. Uh, and, of course, we were doing the Alpha Tech Notebook at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was coming back to going back to school and I, I really wasn't getting the classes that I wanted and things that I was interested in. Uh-huh. And um, I had done, I had done work on school newspaper and that's how I got tickets to see uh, star Wars before it opened. Um, oh, wow. We all got to go to, uh, I think I went to a different press screen than they did, but um, 
you know, so we had a lot to talk about. So when the opportunity came up and Kerry Quinn and Norm Jacobs, the publishers said to me, would you be interested in staying on? I said, yeah, I'd rather stay on than go back to school. I even tried, you know, because I had already registered for school, I tried doing some night classes and it just really wasn't working out. But I ended up working for them for about five and a half years. How did it come about that Jerry got a column in the magazine? Did he have it before you came on? No, no, no. Um, when I went to England in the uh, in December 77, we, we arranged to meet. Uh, he was at, um, was it? Elstree or Borum? I, I always get them mixed up. One, no, Borum was the one that UFO was in close. It was, it was Elstree. He had an office at Elstree. And I've got a, um, I was supposed to meet him at a certain time, but taking mass transit, I got there about an hour early. And I was too embarrassed to show up. And I sat on a bus stop bench in the freezing cold for about <laughs> half an hour till I finally said, I have to give up. I have to go in and <laughs> take my lumps. <laughs> Well, you know, again, we got along really well. He offered to drive me back to my hotel and we stayed in touch. And when I got back to the States, you know, I said, you know, maybe Jerry would be interested in doing a column. Would you let me pitch it to him? I did. And part of the reason to do this was Jerry was now freelance. After Space Year 2, he was no longer involved with Lou Grade because Lou Grade wanted to go into movies. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time in 15 years that Jerry had, 15, almost 20 years, that Jerry had no backer because he would go to Lou with a pitch, with, do a pitch idea on a regular basis. And with a handshake, Lou would say, go and do it. So now Jerry has to run out and raise money. Mm -hmm. And because the shows had sort of dropped off in the United States, when he would go to anybody in, in the States for backing, they would like, who are you? Where are your shows? What are you doing now? And that was always the case. What are you doing now? And since he, he was trying to pitch various projects, there were some projects that came and went that other people <clears throat> took away from him. So he tried desperately to get things off the ground. And I thought this is a good way to get him exposure. The TV movies were another. And, uh, you know, he started, to, he would write a column when he could. I would fill in when I had to. Uh, we did a lot of question and answer columns where he would just basically um, respond on audio cassette and then mail me the cassette. Oh, and wow. I transcribe everything. How did you get the questions to him? Were they just questions that he received? Uh, sometimes, but most of the time it was from mail from uh, Starlog readers. Gotcha. So I would edit them together. And send him these questions. And, um, you know, we talk about certain subjects. Um, you know, we, um, we did a thing, a small thing on Five Star Five when that looked like it was coming. I, mean, I spent two weeks uh, at Pinewood doing some script rewrites and uh, working with his marketing guy, Keith Shackleton, who had been with him for years. I worked out of Keith's office. Now, what was Five Star Five for those who might not know? Well, Five Star Five, was, as Jerry would describe it, it was where eagles dare in outer space. It, right now, to, to young people, I, I would say it's, it was kind of like Guardians of the Galaxy ah. because it involved a group of misfits, including a talking chimp, and ah. they go on a rescue mission. So it was, it was written by... Tony Barwick? Tony Barwick. And I think, was Donald James involved? I don't think so. Because I know Tony at the time was doing a lot of World War II novels with Donald James under James Barwick. Okay. Uh, so uh, we had the script. He was working with uh, a gentleman who had produced the Who movie, The Kids Are All Right. And they had offices at Pinewood. And um, a lot of the, uh, I, I think the financing was coming through someone in Israel. And within about a week's time after getting the green light, the money disappeared and they never got the money. So the project fell apart, but uh, there was a lot of pre-production that they laid out money. I know uh, I knew that someone was designing some models. Mm -hmm. And then again, as I said, with, with Keith uh, Shackleton, we were talking about merchandising, including me writing the book on the making of the film. Oh, uh, wow. 
I don't think I was going to do the novelization. I think um, I was just going to suggest writers for that. Because I remember I brought Tony, excuse me, I brought uh, Keith a whole bunch of um, making of books to show him what I wanted to do versus what had been done because uh, there were there were books like um, the making of Superman, the movie, which yeah. were very honest. You know, things go wrong. We talk about that. We address that. And then you get the making of King Kong where it's like, oh, the giant monkey doesn't work, but everything's okay. You yeah, know, we're it's, it's the kind of schedule, uh, but everything's okay. style. Yeah, no, no, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to talk about the, the, the you know, what is involved in filmmaking. I want to, yeah. to expose people who like myself at the time would have been new to filmmaking. I had never been on a film set up to that point. It mm -hmm. wasn't until maybe about two years later that I was back at Pinewood um, talking to Derek Meddings. He was on, doing crawl. And that's when I actually got onto the film sets and it was eye opening to me. Had you ever worked on a script before you worked on five star five? Uh, no. So it was your first time kind of handling the pages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had done some minor little script rewriting when we were doing the Super Space Theater movies because I had written the uh, Mr. On introduction that we had to re-record, and I storyboarded the um, the um, ending for UF Invasion UFO that um, uh, we had to – we didn't do for the initial release because there was a, a rushed release for uh, one cable channel, and then – we went back in and re-edited this little better outro that we had planned to do. And I had storyboard that to show them what clips we were going to put together since it was sort of like a cobble together. I mean, there's a lot of cobbling on that movie. That was our yeah. most ambitious. Which one was that? Invasion UFO. Invasion UFO was the first yeah, one. Yeah, because we took, we took multiple episodes. We sort of created a new opening to it. Um, mm -hmm. Later on, it was just simply four episodes of half hour shows and you had to cut them down. So they would fit like a 95 minute uh, running time because it had to fit a two hour time slot with commercials. Kind of artistically, what was your, your goal? I know you had to kind of create some product for the, the market, but what were you trying to achieve like with those films as a fan and were you well, trying as a to, fan, I yeah, I was trying to get them back on so people could see them. And I was trying to do them as a sort of, you uh, so cohesive story. I didn't want mm -hmm. to seem like we just slapped four episodes together. Sometimes it worked like um, Revenge of the Mr. Ons from Mars. We had the, uh, all the episodes that involved the Mr. On moon complex. Right. It's kind of a natural connection. Right. We had the fire flash episodes in Thunderbirds to the Rescue. It was, I tried to find a connection. I mean, uh, looking back, I had wished that I hadn't hated the uh, flashback episodes so much that used a lot of stock footage because I, because now I look at them going, that would have made so much better sense to use those episodes and just put the whole episode in yeah. instead of you know, five minutes of footage. You could have gotten half the series in a movie. That right. Way. It would have made my life <laughs> a lot simpler. Um, yeah. But I mean, it worked, it worked, the intention worked out because, you know, here you got Stephen and Andrew doing, they did the Thunderbirds uh, reconstructions from the audio mm -hmm. stories. They're doing the anniversary episodes. Right, that they're doing Nebula seventy five now. They're doing really successful with the puppetry. They did it, an episode of Endeavor. Yeah, and Stephen Stephen admit admitted to me that he was inspired by those movies. That was those were his first exposure. Yeah, because they were on video. I think before yeah. some of the the episodes of the show, even. Yeah, yeah, the videos came out first because back then when it was video cassette, you couldn't put out a uh, TV series. You know, you did maybe yeah. one or two episodes, but. This was, in a, in a sense, a lot of ways that people, especially, you know, dur and during that time, saw the show until there was the whole yeah. revival in the '90s. Right, it was a big introduction for a lot of people. Talk to me right. about the the conclusion for uh, Revenge of the Misterons from Mars, where you kind of crafted a uh, a different kind of ending. Yeah, no, well, we only did the the Misteron voiceover really for that. Uh huh. There wasn't much to that. I mean, because after that, after that, we had to, they were starting to churn them out very fast. Wasn't there a, a bit of a animation in addition to the voiceover too? Kind of the pyramid it in was, space. Yeah, there was a lot of this computer animation 
nonsense <laughs> that I had nothing to do with, <laughs> and I had even Just less. So we to can do clear with. the clear the right. air on that. That was never my. I mean, I hated it. the first time I saw Stingray with the laser beams. I was like, "What?" Ooh. But what really bothered me more than anything else was um, when we did Invasion UFO. Bob used some stock library music to fill in stuff like the opening title, some some sequences that had no music, or we had to edit around existing music. Mm-hmm. And I think some of it was from a car commercial or something. But Barry was appalled. I was appalled. So Barry said, look, I will send you my music, Barry Gray, because I, I was very good friends with Barry Gray. So he sent Bob copies of all the scores for the episodes we were using. And instead of just using them to reconstruct titles and, and everything, Bob literally slathered the episodes from beginning to end with music, <laughs> like he was scoring a Warner Brothers cartoon. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, this is horrible. Wow. It was terrible. And then when we did um, Cosmic Princess, the uh, Space Nine in Year Two uh-huh. from, uh, Breakaway, from uh, Metamorph and Space Warp, he mixes in Barry's music with Derek Wadsworth because there was some kind of different arrangement they had with Derek Wadsworth in year two that they didn't have the right to just arbitrarily use Derek's music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had this weird mix of, (laughs) of styles and it kind of gave you an idea what would have been had Barry scored year two, which network then went and completely rescored uh, a second season episode, Seed of Destruction, for their Blu-ray set, which is really interesting because they even did the main title from year one for year two, uh, which I don't think made it to the um, the Shout Factory Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. I don't think so. So it sounds like you kind of lost some of the creative control as time went on and the process kind of sped up. Yeah, I mean, you know, I could, I, I was only doing this when I wasn't working at Starlog, you know, I would take a couple of long lunches and go up to ITC and grab <laughs> things. Were you editing physically? Well, the way it started was we would watch episodes at ITC, but that became impractical. Mm-hmm. So I would give Bob a list of episodes that I was interested in. I would take them back to Starlog and on the weekends, I'd go in, we had a projection room with a 16 mil projector and I'd watch the episodes, make notes. And once Bob accepted the uh, episodes we were going to use, I would take the prints and we had an editing deck at Starlog and I'd physically edit them. So I'd cut out the uh, sequences that we thought we could do away with Mm -hmm. uh, to get us down to the running lengths. And then those episodes would be their guide uh, to do the the, uh, video editing. Uh, He would have brand new 35 mil prints struck in London, send them over. They would transfer them to a uh, videotape. And then he went to um, uh, some local companies and they would do the editing there. Now, were you aware that these films later on were satirized by mystery science theater? Oh, oh, 3000? Yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. I have them. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, they deserved it. I have to say they deserved it. It was, it was funny. Cause when I was doing, uh, when we're talking about the SSD stuff with Fanderson, they had never heard of Mystery Science Theater. So I had sure. to send uh, Roz Connors co- the copies. And uh, in fact, Fanderson has a book that I helped out with on the SSD movies. I had copies of the uh, key art for each episode. So the book has nice mini posters of all the key art for all the movies. That's so cool. that was a lot of fun to do. They had been after me for years to write this book, and I like I had no time, and it felt kind of weird writing about myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, find somebody to write about it. I will, you know, work with them, give them whatever informa- material I have, and we'll do this. And it turned out really well. I'm very proud of it. Great. Oh, it's so Love nice it. to have some genuine American voices there and not yep. do the interview. I mean, I've, so so I'm nice so to lazy. have an interviewer who, who knows what he's doing. That well, that is Real, also. That, uh, I mean, an interviewer who's clearly done their research rather yeah. than just turning up and just saying random words. 
and who really listens, you know, rather than just wanting to hijack them yeah, into you and talk you, about themselves. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah mm. so. uh, anyway, now we have had some messages over on our Facebook group, which I'd like to read out. But before I do that, <laughs> well, no, stop. Before you do any what? of that, yes, I just say that next week there's more David Hirsch. Oh, great, good. Um, and uh, and by the way, he's recently announced that uh, he's doing a book with Robert E. Wood and Christopher Penfold about the origins of Space 1999. Ah, They'll be nice. tracking the progression of the origins from UFO 2, the yeah. first half-hour script 0G, and the final format that was uh, developed by the original story consultant uh, George Bellack. Okay, great. So um, there's some unfilmed and alternative storylines and some various other bits in there, courtesy of the Martin Landauer estate, and I guess that's coming out later in the year. So there you go. Great. Well, uh, I look forward to that. More David next week. I don't think he speaks about that in this interview because it was recorded before they spoke about it, but now you know. So there we go. Fine. Yes, good. Uh, over on our Facebook group, Anthony Blunt says, it looks like SpaceX are getting ever closer to building real Thunderbirds 1 and 2. Mm. Latest development seems to be switching from horizontal and vertical flight. Oh, yes. I mean, we can't watch any of that stuff, can we? And the Mars landing without thinking of Jerry Anderson. Can, no, of course can not. We? It's impossible. It's so much part of our psyche, isn't it, as we watch that stuff? 100%. Yeah, no, uh, and, and especially when they blow up. Yeah, well, quite, yes. <laughs> yeah, from multiple angles. Mark Perkins says, I never quite understood the ending of Terror in New York City. When Ned Cook, a few weeks on from his ordeal, says he'd like to thank International Rescue from the bottom of my heart, but says, no one knows who they are or where they come from. I only hope my words will reach those gallant people. We, the viewers, can see that they're all sitting on the back row of the audience. But how did they get there? Unless Ned is pretending about not knowing who they are, he can't have arranged for them to be there. And why are they there? Unless they've been invited as a gesture of thanks, why would almost the entire population of Tracy Island make the trip? They're hardly big fans of his, given his behaviour at the start of the episode, and this sidesteps a blindingly obvious point, what if there's an emergency? But then again, perhaps I'm overthinking it a little. It's a great episode. You might, you might be. Yeah. I, see, I always thought that he was doing a knowing sort of... You know, I've agreed not to reveal who they are, but I know, wink, wink, so wherever they are. Mm. <laughs> that, isn't that funny that I, that was my interpretation, yeah. maybe, maybe I'm yeah. way off. Is there a real Fair answer? Enough. Can somebody, can somebody elucidate? The definitive answer to that conundrum. I'm looking at you, Chris Dale. Let us know. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, yeah. Uh, put that crook, he's got that sort of shepherd's crook, he's wielding it in quite a threatening manner. I, I think he wants to get on to the next bit but oh, we'll I do see, that in a right, second well, Chris yeah but because very quickly I just want to read out this Jamie I, I know this is going to cheer you up no end because Tom Holden over on our Facebook group has given us a very special <laughs> yes it's a quick five five and I love it when our podstrons do all the hard work for me he's given you Jamie five options but which are you going to choose from these uh, are you ready yes tea with Penelope or pub with Parker pub with Parker Yes. Fire Flash or Skydiver? Uh, oh, Skydiver. Okay. Fab Fact or Newsy News News News? Fab Fact. Sorry, Dickie. <laughs> oh, uh, you, have a vi- you have to be a villain for the week. Do you challenge the protectors or invade Moonbase Alpha? Uh, invade ma- in- Moonbase Invood. Alpha? Oh, dear. <laughs> yes, that's what should. I'll do. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, would you rather have Sergeant Major Zero remix your chart hits or Stewed Apples command your secret mission? Oh, no. Uh, yeah, z- z- Zero's hits, I think. Oh, really? That's disappointing. Sorry. But there we are. That's this week's very special from <sighs> Tom Holden. Quick Fire Five. Well, thanks, Tom. Actually, they weren't too bad because they were quite fun. Some no. some weeks they're quite uh, yes. difficult and unpleasant. Yeah, but thank yes. you, Tom. Thank you. There you go. Well, there we are. In the meantime, don't forget you can subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Oh, uh, yes. Simply hit the subscribe button and that way you'll get a notification every time a new episode appears. You can leave us a rating and let us know what you think. And of course, copy and paste the link on all your socials so all your mates get to listen as well. Yes, because people keep finding us amazingly. And then lots, I know. Lots of people emailing saying, I'm currently listening to Pod 15. Pod 19. Oh, I know. Yes. It's extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> I know. I'd love to listen back to one of those early ones. Oh, I don't think you should. Day. Really? No. Fair enough. <laughs> Right. It's best not. Uh, no. <laughs> let's uh, hand over now to Archbishop Randomizer himself, Chris Dale, who mm-hmm. is about yes. to, I guess, sit down, maybe stand up, I don't know, uh, yeah. to uh, to bring us a random Jerry Anderson episode with his thoughts, feelings, uh, emotions, gags, observations, and analyses. Uh, so, Chris, do you want to start doing that now? Okay. Okay. Oh. 
Morning, all. How did you get in here? Well, the, the, the lift. You, you leave it open to the public. I'm not sure why. Anyway, just thought I'd stop in and see how things were at Allington Bridge. Lost any more spaceships recently? No, I haven't. Oh, OK. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Don't blame him too much. He's sort of upset and worried at the moment. Ah, so he has lost another spaceship. It isn't necessary for you to inform him of the position, Clayton. No, no, your own disasters are your own affair, obviously. What on earth's he up to now? Look, the fella's just trying to help. Yes, I suppose so, but we don't need any help from him or anyone else. No, but I need your help, actually. See, I've got this piece of equipment. It's a bit more high-tech than the stuff you have here, but... You're a troublemaker, huh? What's wrong with our equipment, may I ask? Well, it does lack a certain randomness, and that's what this machine, the randomizer, is all about. You see, I travel the Jerry Anderson universe with this machine, asking people to press the button to select random Anderson episodes for me to watch. And after two and a bit years, I'm over 25% of the way through now, you know? He's still at it, poor fella. Yes, I... yes. I don't suppose he, he might have escaped from somewhere, huh? So, uh, which of you would like to help me out today? It's a perfectly straightforward problem that we're capable of handling ourselves. Ah, thank you. Clayton, keep an eye on this fellow. We can't have him running all over the site, sticking his nose in. Oh, I assure you, I'll be gone as soon as we get the printout. I bet you're hoping for a Thunderbirds episode, eh? International rescue? Certainly not. No, 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 absolutely not. Right, let's see. Ah, well, not Thunderbirds, but close. It's Stingray with a story about a race of aliens living under a lighthouse. Yeah, I knew it all along. The man's a nut. They're here. Oh, uh, apparently they've arrived, sir. Thanks, gents. Here's the lighthouse dwellers. And let's hope that we're not the ones to ruin it. So, welcome back to Stingray. We haven't seen Stingray on the randomizer since, uh, oh, since Christmas, actually, with the Lighthouse Dwellers, one of the final episodes to be produced, although I believe in the original broadcast, UK broadcast run anyway, it was uh, dumped somewhere in the middle in that, uh, that crazy UK Stingray broadcast order. Here we are on the Arago Rock Lighthouse. Arago Rock Lighthouse from Marineville calling Frank Lincoln. Hello, Commander Short. I guess it's time, huh? Right so, Frank. Are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be, Commander. Thanks, Frank. When it's done, guess you can go home. Home? <laughs> oh, it's a laugh. My real home's here. Oh, well, no sense in brooding. About to switch off power. And I love the, the setup for this episode. I, firstly, I love the look of the lighthouse exterior and interior set. Here we go. He's put out the light for the last time. Oh, but he's getting a plaque out of it. The Arago Rock Lighthouse has a national... 1890 to 2065. So we have a, 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 a date there. Quite rare to get a screen confirmation of when all this is actually happening. Another dedication. To the lighthouse keeper. Yeah, 40 years operating that light. He won't be forgotten. Service light. Even though we're not mentioning his name at this meeting. But the lighthouse has been his home, his life. He'll be lost now. Are you suggesting the lighthouse should continue to operate just to keep him happy? Oh, of course not. <laughs> That's an odd tone to take at a meeting to uh, dedicated to this man's service. The first aircraft will be coming into land at the new airbase on Arrigo Point. This is Admiral Friendor. Not very friendly, um, but he, he does look like a... About all this as you are. A revamp of an old puppet. He looks vaguely familiar. We'll show our appreciation. Some quite magnificent eyebrows Pretty on him. for him. Guess he'd like that. Oh, that's a great idea, Father. He'll be the guest of honour. Swell, Atlanta. Yeah, party solves everything in Marineville. He's led a tough, lonely life with only the sea for a companion. And also something I love in this episode is uh, the, the model effects. The lighthouse. So long. And these rolling waves around it. And also the the puppet shots of... Uh, Your winking eye is gonna be in the way from now on. Little old uh, Frank in his boat here. Accelerating away from the lighthouse, but... Here comes the first aircraft. Yeah, lovely stormy sea. Lots of uh, waves lapping all over the place. 27 to Arago Tower. Approaching you from the south. That's not Troy Tempest, this is a... 127 from Arago. And that's also not Atlanta. This is a pilot approaching uh, the Arago uh, airfield. Nine. Here go the landing lights. Visibility very poor there. This is why the lighthouse has had to be put out because it's in the way of the, uh, the, the landing lights. Winking for six generations. Now 
up for evermore. And it's back on. And I love that. He's making this little speech. Oh, it's the end of the lighthouse. And then, uh uh-oh. He's even standing up in the boat. That's how uh, serious this is. Uh Uh-oh. And the plane is turning towards the lighthouse. From 127. Am I clear to join circuit? 127 from Arrigo. Clear to join. Approach on the B marker. Roger, tower. This pilot also looks a bit like... uh, Okay. uh, Lieutenant Misen from Marineville Traitor, who was... uh, you were thrown in prison for being a traitor and then appeared in several subsequent episodes. He's got the helmet obscuring most of his face, but I'm pretty sure that's him. He's too low! He'll hit the rocks! Far up, man! 127 to Arago. Visibility bad. Cannot see runway approach lights. Am I in correct position? He's gonna crash! We're almost building up to a Thunderbird-style rescue situation. He's gonna clip the lighthouse. Oh, he hit the rock instead. And that's it. Splash down. Oh, that doesn't sound good. A room rocket. That means they're gonna launch a rescue helicopter. They've gotta find out how that light went on again before the next aircraft arrives. I could go over and see if that pilot needs help. It's still on, Troy. But, uh, no nope. plane to crash. Have they picked up the pilot, sir? Yeah, he's okay, but. Why is the light on? Have you tried to radio the lighthouse? Been trying since I got word five minutes after the crash. There's no answer. Mm, Old Frank Lincoln will take time to reach that light. Yeah, that is if he went back to the mainland. Keep trying the lighthouse, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. I also like that Shaw is wearing his his dress uniform with medals uh, for most of the rest of this episode. In fact, it shows that all of this is taking place very soon after that little uh, plaque dedicating ceremony. Which, thinking about it, I suppose they should have saved until Lincoln was actually back on shore to uh, to witness. It's kind of pointless dedicating a plaque to his, um, his, his service and the lighthouse he was working at if he's not there to see it. Rising up through the lighthouse here on the... Uh, well, he's on the left, but the back... Uh, projection material. It looks like the uh, the Mar- the Marineville interior where they're going down into the Stingray uh, launch tubes, the injector tubes, anyway. What? You will not turn out the light. Come in, Frank. Frank t- trying to turn out the uh, power again, and there's a, there's a little alien there who won't let him. There's something strange going on out there, Troy. Stand by to launch Stingray. I want that lighthouse investigated. I also like that, uh, unless I've waffled over it, I don't think anybody says, oh, well, it's Frank, he, uh, he's decided to stay. Silly old Frank. Nobody actually doubts him, which is quite nice. Oh, this is a lovely model of the lighthouse. Thanks, Dingy. That means Frank must be there now. Yeah. And again, the rain just rolling down the, uh, the windows of Stingray. This is one of those episodes where I worry if we ever get Blu-rays, it's going to look a bit... Take her in, folks. The effects are going to look a bit uh, weaker than than they do in the sort of um, murkiness of of SD. But, uh, oh, this stuff looks lovely. Okay, except for this uh, rock-stiff model of Troy standing on top of Stingray. And here she goes, Phones. Okay, I can make it now. Right, Phones. Pull clear. Listen out in case I need some help. That's uh, unusually am- unambitious for an Anderson show, not showing Troy making the leap from Stingray to the lighthouse. Anyway, Troy's made it safely. He hasn't slipped over or cracked his head on a rock. Frank, where are you? It's Troy Tempest. I know. Go away. Frank. I love how old and lived in and rustic this lighthouse looks as well. There's all sorts of rust and decaying boxes all over the place it looks it looks very real this is a lovely looking episode frank frank where are you it's try tempest i come for that money you owe me bones i'm turning off the light still no sign of frank i like that troy is absolutely soaked but his hat untouched do not move tempest or you are a dead man oh Give me your wrist radio. Oh, there's another lovely shot of the lighthouse, this time from from above, almost directly over the lighthouse. Can you hear me? Come in, Troy. 
Ah, this is going to be one of those episodes where they send people over one by one to get kidnapped. Stingray, contact with Captain Tempest broken. Request emergency instructions. Is the light still operating phone? Yes, sir. Then you'd better get in there and help him. Troy must be in trouble. Meanwhile, I'm eating a sandwich, smoking a cigar, and having a cup of coffee. I love that with Shaw. That's quite a, f a frequent thing where they Stingray radios into Marineville for for help or advice, and Shaw is he's all set for a, a nice hearty lunch. Anyway, it's now Phones' turn to go over and see what's what. Which means Marina is all alone in Stingray. Troy, where are you, Skipper? Surely, as two people who have disappeared here mysteriously before me, I could maybe be in trouble here, but uh, I'll just for the elevator. go to turn off the light. Oh, there is an alien. And Tempest dies. Oh, well, this is going well. Our crack rescue squad is uh, now down by two thirds. And speaking of down, they've been taken back in the lift. Stand perfectly still. Oh, they had a, a hidden underground elevator at the base of the lighthouse. Very well hidden. Can see how Frank uh, missed that all these years. We are now beneath the ocean's level. And yep, here we go. Another little... Well, I can't say underwater city. It's one of those uh, uh, underwater rooms with city behind it implied uh, setups that they have in Stingray. Another alien gentleman to uh, join the previous alien gentleman. I believe these two alien puppets are redressed from, from previous aliens. Oh, what kept you? Oh, I, I want to say these... They look very similar to the aliens from Emergency Marineville. Secure the new prisoner, Lorif. Very well, Chroma. I'm fairly sure that's Chroma. Yeah, they've got sort of uh, we can now pronounce tassels for hair and beards. Sentence? For what? You attempted to destroy us. By putting out the great light. What are you talking about? You deny that you extinguished the light? No. But what has that got to do with you? Without the light, we would die within a week. All our people would perish. This is a nice setup for a, a Stingray story. I will show you. The, the misunderstanding that uh, nobody who had anything to do with the lighthouse realized there was a whole civilization thoroughly dependent on the light reasons we're about to see. The sea and enemies on the rocks of the ocean bed. When the great light flashes, the sea and enemies open. When it goes out, they close. We have harnessed the energy that they produce. The movement of each flower operates a small generator. I also love with Stingray, you get some really weird... The, the, the underwater world in Stingray is, is really weird. There's some very strange stuff goes on down there. And everyone just accepts it. I, I can't believe it. It's very nice. You guys have been living beneath my lighthouse for years. I, I never knew. I've been so lonely I could have invited them up to play bridge. The lighthouse is as important to them as the sun is to us. It is obvious it was... Anyway, Troy and Phones and Frank are now uh, tied up and manacled to the wall. Oh, no. You must be destroyed. We've got to try to convince these guys we're not out to hurt them. It's our only chance. Stingray from Tower. Hello, Marina. We want to talk to you. Use the code, will you? Fine, Marina. I like this as well, the code they, they work out with Marina over the course of the series. And sometimes, I think the first few times they used it, when she's banging on the microphone, nobody has a clue what's going on. And now, here by the end of the series, it's like, we know this is well established. Uh, again, it's one of those things that doesn't make any sense in the original broadcast order. Atlanta? Diver. With this airing halfway through, but uh, never mind. Yeah. Keep calm. Help is on its way. Yeah, this one's tucked away. Jesus, we'll see that the light... Um, in the, I think this is one of the last episodes to be made. Actually, very close to the last Christmas, uh, to the last Stingray episode we did, Christmas to Remember. Anyway, the aliens are prepared to believe the Stingray crew, but uh oh, a light! It has been extinguished. Marineville, Commander Shaw must have cut the power. So, you lied, Tempest. It was a trick to escape. We are doomed. But the Terranians will die first. Now hold on. We know why the light has failed, so we can fix it. 
Good try. Yay! Communication and negotiation. This is another trick. You've got to trust us. It's your only hope of survival. He is right, Groma. We need the light. We must force them to repair it. This man was the lighthouse keeper. He knows how it works. He can fix it. What? Don't lay all that pressure on me, Troy. Oh, sure, Troy. I, I get it. We could release the old one. Yes. And keep the other two as hostages. Very well. You will have 250 light flashes to do the work. After that, Tempest and the one called Phones will die. 250 uh -oh. light flashes? Well, how long's that? I figure it's about 30 minutes our time. Gee, you got... Of course, I could be wrong, but I'm saying it very confidently, which means I'm probably right. You gotta work fast. I want that lighthouse thoroughly investigated and Tempest, Phones, and Lincoln found. Rescue launch 8, PWOR. Oh, I hope there's still time, Father. There's gotta be, Atlanta. There's just gotta be. You'd better... Hmm. So we're now sending in a load of nobodies to, uh, to investigate. I left the old one in the lighthouse. Good. Now we wait. If your friend does not return, it will cost you your lives. Well, this ain't gonna be easy. Stingray has broken the moorings. I have to use the boat. Yep, more lovely, uh, lovely stormy weather stuff. It's been stormy ever since we first saw Orego, and I think it's going to be stormy for the rest of the episode. One thing I wonder about um, the puppets, um, and it's it's something I've thought about through Stingray and also into Captain Scarlet particularly, is um, how how tough the puppets are at times like this when they're exposed to the elements, like when they're in water or like in Scarlet when they're having, you know, whole buildings thrown on top of them. Was there ever any problems with, like, water getting in and actually damaging the puppets? I would imagine they're very fragile, but, uh... In. They seem to throw these poor things through all sorts of, uh, trials and traumas, and, uh, they just keep right on working. Hundred and twenty-five light flashes left, Tempest. Fifteen minutes. What's keeping Frank? He should be aboard Stingray by now. Say, Troy, supposing Marina's too scared to let Frank in. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Luckily, Frank's bought a piece of paper and a pen, and he can write a message that he... Oh, I love this. I love the way he can... You've got the puppet outside Stingray, which is being rained on, and he's got the note pressed up to the glass saying, Troy needs help, let me in. I would say it's a little out of character for Marina to uh, to just leave him out there. Answer me, ma'am. Which is a control. And now once he's in, she's being absolutely useless. Different controls here. Not even helping him. Which I know she can't communicate with him, but she's not even helping him. Light flashes to go, Tempest. Less than 40 seconds. Come on, Frank. Come on, Frank. Need something, ma'am. I'm trying to save Troy and Phones. It's a lot to, to put on a on a guest character like this. You know, our heroes are in jeopardy. Who's going to save them? It's that old man we've never seen before and we'll never see again. I guess Frank didn't make it in time, Troy. Yeah. Ah, this is clever as well. If you can't get the power restored to the lighthouse, use Stingray's own lights on and off to uh, activate those uh, sea anemones. What a clever chap Frank is. This is a guy um, Marineville and the associated peoples of the, uh, I don't know, the Navy or whatever don't want to uh, have their employ anymore. Oh, time's almost run out for Troy and Phones. The aliens are taking aim. Ah. Right. It's okay. Frank did it. You are safe, Terranians. You kept your word. We are all saved. For your death would have been ours, too. Oh, that's it. Everyone's all happy and, uh... It's all sorted out. Or is it? This is a nice shot of, well, very, a very close-up shot of Stingray pulling away from the lighthouse. I love this lighthouse. This whole, the model side of this episode is gorgeous. If you're wondering, actually, as I, uh, as I see this shot, I'm, I'm reminded, the first time I ever saw this episode, um, complete would have been on the DVDs, but uh, I saw a very brief 
shot, and it might have been that one, at a convention, the first convention I ever went to, which was a, a Fab 2 Thunderbirds fun day in Margate. We are doomed. I put my head through the, the door of the viewing room and that shot was up. We have one week to live, Larif. Just one short week. You and I, and the presumably thousands of our fellow aliens who are just behind that door over there. An unfailing devotion. Yeah, it's another of those civilizations. Yeah, because uh, I present Stingray wasn't around to uh, mark of our appreciation. To, to switch its lights on and off anymore. The anemones have gone out, so the aliens think they're all going to die. This. There's more, Frank. We've got you a job at the tracking station. You'll be in charge of the signal lights. Ah. Oh. Swell, Troy. New life's not going to be so bad after all. Of course, you'll have to work with the tracking station guy. He's quite excitable. The party. Uh, one thing still bugging me, Troy. Um, those guys under my lighthouse. Without the light, they'll die. Yeah, we kind of tricked them, didn't we? Kind of funny, wasn't it? At this moment, the engineers are working on something that'll give Prisma light for all time. Yeah, because of course they can't turn the light back on for fear of more planes crashing into it. The air beach? No, Frank. We're taking the gadget out tomorrow night, and the aircraft won't even see it. It'll be under the ocean. This is such a nice end to this episode. It is rather sad when you look at the aliens and they're just sat there in their room going, Oh, we are doomed. Because the Stingray crew's gone, there's nothing they can do. Try. Okay, phones. Release submarine beacon. This is probably one of my favourite endings to any Anderson episode. Just the Stingray crew coming back with this light reflector thingy that they've built, especially to help this underwater civilization. And I do love it when when we have antagonists in, in this show that aren't just villains. I like, I think I prefer actually, where you have aliens like this who are they're not bad as such. The Terranian craft. They have brought us new light. We are saved. The Terranians are good people, Krova. Yes, Lorif. Men of their word. We should never have doubted them. It's such a nice way to end the episode. You know, we're not blowing up another underwater city. We're helping people. And that's such a nice way to end a lovely little story. And, and of course, Stingray just sailing off into the end credits and that was the lighthouse dwellers oh i really like that one i don't hear this one get praised enough probably because it's it's stuck at the um the back end of the series it's well it's the penultimate episode on uh, most dvds and repeat runs these days but uh, i think this is yeah you know, it shows that even by the end of the series uh, if this was one of the last to be filmed they're still putting their all into the effects side of this and the story it's, it's a lovely setup for a, a misunderstanding and I think uh, I, I would have to assume that writing a, a scenario like this is, is is much more difficult than just a here are some baddies and they've set a trap and we've got to get out of here and, and then blow them up to create a, a sympathetic race of antagonists who you know they can be a threat but we can also we can help them at the end and I just that ending is just so nice. It's so pleasant. It's so much what I, I associate with uh, the best of Anderson. I mean, particularly Thunderbirds later on. Just this idea of, you know, we can have our differences. We can have our disagreements. But at the end, we can still come together and help each other out through a bad spot. So The Lighthouse Dwellers, one of my favourite episodes of Stingray. Really glad to see this one come up today. The Lighthouse Dwellers. Oh, another, yeah. Another sort of yeah. va vaguely uh, euphemistic episode title here. <laughs> well, in, only in your fetid mind, Yeah, you mind, know that, Jim. Richard James. He's a yeah. terrible lighthouse dweller. He really is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't right. know why suddenly these episode titles have, have no. made me feel uh, that they're euphemistic in any way, shape, mm. or form. I can only apologise. Mm, uh, terribly sorry. I'll go and do um, 50 Hail Marinas now. I think you should. Stingray, I bet everyone sang along to the theme tune at home as they were listening to that. You can't well, help to sing along to that. Are you more of an opening title s uh, singer? Just yeah, doing I a Stingray? Stingray yes. Or are you more of an end titles singer no, doing no, Marina? No. No, no, I'm an opening titles man Syrupy myself. Syrupy old love song. That's it's, right. I, yes. You know, I kind of liked it, but I, the end titles of Stingray, as a kid, 
made me feel slightly icky and uncomfortable. You know how when you're a, you know, especially a little boy, I think, yes. you sort of go, ugh, kissing, yeah. ugh, oh. good girls, mm-hmm. ugh, and all that sort of stuff, mm. uh, which I still do now, to be fair. Yeah, I have heard you, yeah. Do you know what? It, it kind of put me off. I sort of, a lot, of, a lot of shows, especially Doctor Who, I would sit and watch the end titles because I liked the visuals and the music and stuff. Yeah, Stingray would kind of leave the room. Would, would you? Did you ever do that? I, I may, maybe it's just me being weird. Yeah. Quite possible. Yeah, very possible. <laughs> Likely, I would say. Uh, uh, anyway, thanks, Chris. Thank you mm. for Stingray. And uh, there'll be another random Jerry Anderson episode next week. Yes. Now, over on Twitter, people have been hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast, tagging me, Richard N. James, him, I'm Jamie Anderson, and him over there with the communion wine, Chris <laughs> Dalek. For example, Alan J. Porter. Yes, I did just research Robert the Robot while writing a business article on artificial intelligence. That's what I get for listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast on my morning walk. Well, glad to oblige, Alan. Carl says, how does one describe the supercar t-shirt which arrived the other day? Simply stylish? Or stylishly simple. Oh, nice. I like that. Glenn Fitzgerald posted a link to an Instagram account, Antique Toy Shop, where they, in turn, had posted a picture of a vintage Thunderbird 5 battery-operated toy by JR21 from 1965. Oh, it's yes. a lovely-looking thing as well, yeah. Uh, Lucy Ryan, just listened to Pod 140 of the Jerry Anderson podcast and just thought I'd stick up for Richard James as an actor. Oh, that's uh, nice. Also, she says, yep, I'd like to mention the many talented writers and Richard James. Oh. <clears throat> Backhanded compliment. And uh, over on YouTube, people have been posting beneath the uh, video of Pod 142. Keith, for example, says another great episode of the Jay Anderson podcast with all the usual banter between Richard and Jamie. Belated birthday wishes for Jamie on March the 1st. Yeah, don't go on about it. Uh, <laughs> great second it. part of the interview with Richard Harvey. Boy, does he like to talk. Very entertaining, though. And another name check from Richard. Well, here's another one, Keith. You'd think it was my birthday, he says. I'd like to point out to Chris Dale that I'm a fan of the UFO episode un- uh, rather identified, this week's <laughs> randomizer choice. I do agree with him, though, that this episode is a shopping list of items to introduce for no real reason. Mm. Great episode, guys. Keep up the good work. And finally, here's an interesting one from Peter. This is regarding Chris's review of episode one of uh, UFO in pod 142. Regarding inherited sterility, it is actually possible and has been achieved experimentally in test populations of insects. It's a potential strategy for the control of mosquito populations and invasive wasp species. This technique is known as a gene drive that uses the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing method to insert errors into specific genes. The technology, developed initially in Drosophila fruit flies as a test case, represents a new take on sterile insect techniques that have been used since the 1930s to mass-produce and release sterile males as a strategy for eradicating insect populations. Oh, amazing. Every day is a school day on the Jerry Anderson it? podcast. There you go. Yeah. Gosh. How wonderful that a, you know, a perfectly random remark on the randomizer led to a, well, almost a, a dissertation Pretty on much, inherited yeah. sterility. Really interesting. Thanks for that, Peter. Yeah. Enjoyed that. Lovely. Good. Love a bit of science. Uh, yes, absolutely. So do remember, you can comment politely, please on everything on the uh, Jerry Anderson YouTube channel. All sorts of stuff there from the uh, Century 21 Tech Talks to the Primers, of course, to whole episodes of stuff as well, I think, as well as a podcast and First Action Bureau. All sorts of things. Loads of stuff on there. Yeah. Uh, That's it for now, but I'm sure I'll have lots more emails, comments and Facebook posts to read out next week. I'm almost certain. I could almost guarantee it. Yes. Oh, I almost certainly is. Yeah, but let's wait and see. Uh, Right, well, I think that's sort of the end, isn't it, for this one? Uh, Yeah, I suppose so. Fine. Well, we're six weeks away from uh, pod 150. Are we? Which seems bonkers. If you'd said we'd be doing 150 podcasts back I when know. we started doing this, I would have said, uh, oh, probably not. But here we yeah. are anyway. Yeah. So we better do something special for that. Who knows what it'll be? Oh, uh, right. Okay. We'll, we'll work it out in due course. Fair enough. Do pop us your thoughts and questions and queries and other musings to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. And uh, I guess we'll probably say some words in your ears next week. Yeah, probably. Great. All right, then. Until then, goodbye. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go.
Um, Jamie. Yes, sir. Oh, here he goes. Right. Uh, pod 150. Yes, sir. Uh, will that be about the same time as uh, Jerry Anderson Day? I believe so. <laughs> okay, right. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Am I going to talk to the real Jamie Anderson ever again? Let me get him now. Sorry, Richard, I was just uh, away <sighs> when while Robert stepped in uh, while I was okay. having a pee again, would you believe? It's all this coffee right. I drink during the recordings. Yeah. Okay, great. Fine, fine. What, so what were you saying? Never mind, it doesn't matter. Oh, all right then, fine. I'll um, see you next week then. Bye, Robert. Goodbye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. 